Welcome to Paris and welcome to PC Euro PCR 2023. My name is Bernard Prendergast. I'm the, one of the course directors at PCR London Valves, and it's a great pleasure to be with you here. For many years, aortic stenosis has been treated by means of surgery only, and surgical aortic valve replacement has been the gold standard treatment. Bioprostheses are now universally used in patients above the age of 50, and we have good data demonstrating that durability of these devices, the contemporary devices, is 10 years at least. This therefore becomes the modern standard for transcatheter aortic valve bi bioprostheses, and we have important emerging data demonstrating the durability of these transcatheter devices and the very realistic prospect that they will begin to challenge the durability of surgical valves in the coming generation. I'm very fortunate to be joined by Raj Makar, who you will all know very well from Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, US. And Raj, it's very interesting to uh, reflect on the data that we have already accumulated and the emerging data that have been presented at this meeting this week. What do we know so far about the durability of TAVI using the first generation of devices? So Bernard, the earliest uh, clinical trials were in patients who were high risk and not many of them survived all the way to five years. But as we moved to randomized clinical trials comparing TAVR with surgery and in intermediate risk patients, specifically the partner two intermediate risk and the SIRTAVI trials, I think we have now accumulated data all the way up to five years that suggest that the hemodynamics of these valves may in fact not only be as good, but in fact might be actually superior to the surgical valves. And additional analyses from these trials, not just looking at group hemodynamics and gradients, but looking at the granular level of structural valve degeneration, looking at different aspects, whether it is uh, you know, a different you know, increase in gradients, or whether it is PPM, whether it is uh, PV leak, and then of course, bioprosthetic valve failure in an escalating fashion, that don't seem to be any major red flags. So I would say that the data are actually reassuring all the way up to five years in these larger clinical trials. And then there's, of course, the Notion trial, which was in lower risk patients, where we've actually eight year data, where the hemodynamics, this is using the uh, supraannular uh, core valve, uh, where the data all the way up to eight years seems to be quite favorable. So. I think we are moving in the right direction. So eight years is good, but 10 years is the goal. And we have data from the very early registries, the pioneer centers, let's say, going out to 10 years and beyond. What do these observational data tell us? Well, I think uh, with all the flaws and limitations of the you know, uh, registries, nonetheless, I have to say these registries that have come out of a couple of these centers, once again, sh suggest that the rates of structural valve degeneration are actually very low. In fact, at 10 years in some of this limited data from Vancouver and yet one more study, the rates are about 5%. I think if this bears out in randomized clinical trials, then I think we will be very competitive with the surgical bi uh, bioprosthesis. So as you say, very encouraging data and no red flag warnings. The next thing of course is the low risk younger patients. And we have the uh, two year data published from Partner 3 and from the Evolute Low Risk Trial. What's coming around the corner in the next year or two from those low risk trials? Yes, so hopefully we will have the five year data presented uh, from both of these trials, the Evolute study as well as the Partner 3 study. And this will give us uh, more information because once again, I think it is not just the number of patients, but I think getting structural valve a degeneration data from patients, most of whom will actually be alive, mm. will give us more confidence, um, you know, as we try to make choices between surgical or transcatheter aortic valve prosthesis. And importantly, now we have very strongly validated uh, echocardiographic criteria whereby we can classify these patients in a rigorous scientific way. That's correct. Which will and strengthen the data. And, and hold surgery to the same standards as the transcatheter 
uh, aortic valve uh, prosthesis because traditionally most of the data with surgical bioprosthesis has been about freedom from reoperation, which doesn't necessarily equate with the uh, malfunctioning of the valve because there could be many patients who may have malfunctioning valves but may not Don't be get another suitable intervention. Uh, for surgery. Exactly. So young patients, durable valves means that we're going to have uh, more procedures to do down the line when the patients eventually reach, let's say, the 10 or the 12 year time points. So redo TAVA or TAV in TAV, as we say in Europe, is going to be a reality. I know that you've been presenting some very important data at this meeting in relation to the redo TAVA concept. Can you summarize that for us very briefly? So what we did was we looked at the TVT registry that includes all patients undergoing TAVA in the United States and we looked at patients who underwent a redo TAVA which was defined as TAVA done at a date other than the index TAVA procedure using the balloon expandable valves and we had more than 1200 patients and what we did was we looked at the rates of complications for example so the procedure was quite safe with very low procedural complication rates number two what we did was we propensity matched these redo TAVR patients with similar patients who were undergoing native uh, aortic valve TAVR or first TAVR and essentially what we found was that death and stroke and re-intervention rates were all very similar between the redo TAVR patients as well as the uh, native TAVR patients. What we all found was that it is the coexisting comorbidities that really dictate mm -hmm. the survival at one year. So when we divided these patients into three different groups, uh, zero to four, four to eight, and more than eight SDS scores, there was an increase in mortality at one year. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the lowest uh, uh, risk group, which is STS score between 0 and 4, uh, where the average score was 2.5, the 30-day mortality was only 0.7%, but it was almost 9% in patients who had STS score more than 8. So I think these patients who are undergoing redo TAVR are a particularly high-risk group with lots of comorbidities, as we would expect. Um, but what we showed was that TAVR is feasible with outcomes that are similar to native TAVR with hemodynamics that may be slightly inferior but probably clinically not relevant. Just a difference of about three to four millimeters of mercury in, in post-procedure gradients between redo TAVR and native TAVR. So in other words, the redo TAVR procedure from the technical standpoint is feasible and safe, but the outcomes are dictated by the underlying comorbidities and the associated risk scores. Uh, that is correct, and I must qualify that there's always a selection bias in the patients that are treated. So that could be anatomical, that could be clinical, uh, you know, so we may have excluded, or the operators might have excluded patients that were particularly high risk for coronary mm -hmm. anatomy. On the other hand, some patients may be too high risk for surgery and they may have been pushed into a redo TAVR uh, scenario, despite uh, the fact that they were actually uh, very high risk and had lots of comorbidities. But again, a consistent message that there are no red flag warning signals in relation to the data as we embark on this journey in younger and lower <laughs> risk patients. That is correct. And someday we might actually end up doing a trial in patients who have failed surgical or, or, or uh, <laughs> transcatheter bioprosthesis whether it should be a redo TAVR or SAVR in these patients. So there you have it. Safety <coughs> is the gold standard with excellent and durable outcomes, but TAVR is catching up extremely quickly with good randomized control trial data existing, reassuring registry observational data and forthcoming data in low risk patients. And excellent data from Raj's uh, presentation at this meeting that the redo procedure is also technically feasible and safe within the limits of observational data. Thanks very much for joining us.